Hello, and welcome to episode 61 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We are here today with former Congresswoman Connie Marilla of Maryland's 8th Congressional District. Connie, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Excellent. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'd like to ask you a first question to get us rolling. Absolutely. What are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? I really hope that all my adult life, professional life that I have, advanced public service and, <laughs> and our community and our country from teaching at Montgomery College, which I think serves the community in terms of being affordable, accessible, and flexible, to serving in the state legislature where I could see democracy in action, uh, and then going to the Federal Congress, being fortunate enough to be able to do that for 16 years. Beyond that, Jordan, I was our United States Ambassador to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris for four years. Uh, Of course, I did a broad country being in Paris. But actually, that came about through the Marshall Plan, uh, where... George Marshall, as Secretary of State at Harvard, gave an address which was about 1,500 words, but words that changed the world, and that's how we got the Marshall Plan. This was right after World War II, correct? Exactly. 1945 is when he gave his speech. Um, And so right now, uh, Jordan, I serve on a number of committees, uh, a number of organizations that I think enhance uh, equality for women, uh, international service. And I serve on the American Battle Monuments Commission. That is uh, a unique commission that oversees all our American cemeteries that are overseas. There are 26 of them, 14 are in France, and it's sacred ground. As a matter of fact, (laughs) interesting in terms of how history connects, the first um, chairman of the Battle Monuments Commission, which began after the First World War, was um, uh, Pershing, General Pershing. Hmm. His successor was George Marshall. So you see how that all connects in terms of uh, uh, our country. So there are a lot of other things I do too, but I guess that's enough for a start. That's quite interesting because Pershing, of course, was one of the leading American commanders in the First World War. So it's almost as if he didn't have enough in World War I, commanding his soldiers, and even after death, he wanted to lord over them with the cemeteries. Um, so that's quite an eclectic uh, array of, of service projects. If we could go back to the very beginning and talk about why it was you ever got involved in politics and campaigns, what even first inspired you to become a Republican? I, I remember reading that you had initially growing up with, in a Democratic household, and then how, how did you end up in the state legislature? So let's start right there. Sure. Well, uh, actually, I, I was a Democrat, and I frankly, I became a Republican in order to vote in a primary to help Charles Mack Mathias, who became a very prominent senator. Mm-hmm. He was in the House, and then he was in the Senate. And then after I uh, became a Republican to, to vote in uh, the primary, incidentally, that's something that should be changed. We should have open primaries uh, so that people don't have to select one party and that independents don't have any franchise. But then I looked around, and rather than changing, I noted Jacob Javits, Clifford Case. There are a whole slew, Howard Baker, a whole slew of very prominent Republicans who actually felt the same way I did in terms of foreign affairs, Mm -hmm. in terms of individual liberties, Mm -hmm. uh, and so I I stayed a Republican. Then I I did my teaching and uh, became uh, selected by the county executive, the first county executive, to serve on something called the Commission for Women in Montgomery County. Hmm. Now, Jordan, that gets back to probably when you were born. It was like 1972. <laughs> 1972, and it really came about. Uh, throughout the country, commissions for women were being set up. The Equal Rights Amendment had passed in Congress. Uh, a woman named Martha Griffiths, who was um, uh, a member of Congress from Michigan, actually through a, a 
a draft resolution mm -hmm. got the bill on the floor of the House. By that I mean she had to have a majority of the members of the House to sign on before it could transcend the committee mm -hmm. and go on the House floor right away. Well, she succeeded. But then for a constitutional amendment, you've got to go to the states. And you have to have uh, the uh, uh, 38 states have got to approve it. So the Commissions for Women, one of the things they did do was to try to advance the Equal Rights Amendment in their state legislatures. So uh, at that point, uh, on the Commission for Women, I did sort of an inventory of the status of women. I'd always been interested, obviously. I think I'm a woman. Um, and I looked at the status of women and, and in uh, uh, credit, housing, education, employment, there was not equity. As a matter of fact, if you looked at the newspaper, there was one section for males in jobs, another section for women, jobs. For a woman, maybe a secretary, a clerk, possibly a rural school teacher, uh, but basically a homemaker. I had but no idea. You're saying that in a time when you grew up, not only were bathrooms separated by colors and whites, but the newspapers were sectioned by male and female. Absolutely. The employment. So the employment such section of the newspaper. Employment for men, employment for women. Absolutely. So you could see the myriad of op opportunities for men. Uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers, construction workers. But women, they weren't looking for them. And what would happen if a woman applied to that job with the same qualifications as a man? I don't know. They'd say probably we don't have an opening. But I know also at that time that if I wanted a credit card, in my name, I'd have to have a male sign for me. So it wasn't until the Equal Credit Law passed Congress, so you see the importance of laws, did that change. It wasn't, a, many times an employer would say, and so if you know that if you're to have a child, you are terminated, or you can't have the job if you are going to have a child. Uh, and it wasn't until the Pregnancy Discrimination Act past Congress, that that changed, that employers were not allowed to um, give you that kind of ultimatum. So, you know, and as I say, uh, ed ed with education, you didn't have women who were presidents of universities. Mm -hmm. We have them now. Mm -hmm. Harvard, you know, MIT. <laughs> and that, that has changed. So, so basically, I just want to say I examined the sphere um, of opportunity for women, and I think whenever you can use women in any profession, anything, if they're capable, you're going to elevate society and you're going to elevate our security um, and our economic sparkle. So then I thought... Well, before we move on, there's, a few, there's so much material that you're bringing to the table right here. The first thing, I want to touch on the Equal Rights Amendment in just a moment, yeah. but before we get to that, I'd like to ask... You were originally a Democrat when you came to Senator Mac Mathias's U.S. Senate office. I have spoken to other. Were, are you aware of other um, subsequently elected Democrats who had worked in his office? Was Martin O'Malley a staffer in Mac Mathias, or or some other Democratic Not governors? I, I, they may have been, but I, you know, but I really don't know. As a matter of fact, I never worked in his office. Oh. I I met uh, Mac Mathias through my husband. My husband, uh, who worked for John Lindsay, did you ever hear that name? John Lindsay became the governor of New York, but before that he was a member of Congress. Huh. He was a very moderate Republican. He was internationally well-known. Tony worked for him. And it was th then Mac Mathias decided from the state legislature he wanted to run for the federal Congress. Yeah. So he pulled in my husband, mm -hmm. who became his kind of key person explaining the issues and explaining Congress to him. So that's how I, I mean, Mac met in this house and also when we were in Rockville to discuss issues. And uh, my husband sometimes was his surrogate so did in you, some of the debates. Did you meet Tony, your husband, through Congress? I met him at Boston University. Okay. No, no. And I met him there. And then we came here because he was going to go to law school. And, and that's how we got here from Massachusetts. So um, he was first interested in politics before you, but you ended up yes, becoming the congresswoman. That's right. He never <laughs> wanted to run for office, but it was through him that I met Mac. 
Interesting. And then we became good friends. And uh, even later, when I became a member of Congress, he was still a mentor of mine, too. Now, right. now speaking about your motivations, you said he never, meaning your husband never wanted to become a politician. Speaking about your motivations, you mentioned a number of issues. It sounds like there were particular issues that seemed to you to be unfair, and that's what motivated you to run, which brings me to the topic of the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, just in terms of constitutional processes, I'm aware that uh, one of the late, most recent constitutional amendments passed into law after originally having passed many state legislatures in the early 19th century when Michigan just as a symbol, uh, passed some piece of legislation and turned out to be the, the last state that needed to pass it. So many states passed the Equal Rights Amendment for women. Why is it no longer possible for just one more state or two more states to pass it and it become law? Why is it expired, but in the other case, it didn't expire? I don't know why in one case it didn't expire. It must have been, I, I don't know, maybe it was the way it was worded. I don't know what the amendment was. But that's exactly what happened. First of all, I must give you the good news. Maryland passed it. I mean, we did. They did. They did pass it. The legislature. Is it significant that it's law in Maryland today? Then did that immediately? Oh, separate, separate, separate laws. Okay. If, I mean, if you have an equal okay. rights, and, no, no, that the constitutional amendment uh -huh. dealt just with getting an amendment into our constitution, which right. doesn't have very many. What twenty-seven? Um, and if if there are not the uh, adequate number of states for it to become a part of the Constitution, forget it. You start from the beginning. So Equal Rights so, Amendment is not the law in Maryland. Well, well I don't know whether it's, if there's a separate. Maybe they pass something that is similar but to it, but by, no. Just by that one action? No. Not okay. At not at all. Okay. No. Uh, the, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment came before the legislatures of the country. Mm -hmm. It did not make the 38 votes it needed. Therefore, legislation was put in, this over a period of years, was mm -hmm. given a period of years. Subsequent to that, another bill went through Congress to extend it. And it was extended, and then that expired. Right now, Jordan, in Congress, is the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, is, a, is a piece of legislation. It hasn't gone through committee, and who knows, it's kind of moribund right now with other things that have come up. Mm -hmm. And um, Congress has passed other laws that affect women. So bottom line, what was my motivation to actually become a candidate? It was the women's movement put the movement into me. And I then thought, you know, the way to get things done is to have a seat at the table. And if not, I might be on the menu. So that was what inspired me to run. Are, are so, you, just, so are you a natural politician? Is this something, if you would have been born 100 years ago or 100 years hence, would you have run for office because the issues would have been different? I don't know. I don't know. I was just so inspired by that. Huh. Oh, and I used to hold office in, in college and high school. If, you, if that's what you mean, do you like want to be right. involved Is it, with, exactly. with reaching out to people? Right. I Is it your personality type? Do you feel like it's something that, that you were always somewhat driven to, uh, called to personally, or is it more just some politicians say, look, I never expected to be elected, but all of a sudden this issue happened, I got more involved, next thing I know I'm elected. Some people say that. Is, yes. Which is your, your case? Well, frankly, I think you don't run for office unless you have a reason. Mm -hmm. And you don't run just for power or just to say, I, I just think I want to run for office. But, uh, but then in addition to that, having a purpose and a plan and perseverance and patience, mm -hmm. all of those things you need, I think you have to have a feeling for people. You have people as part of that. I think you have to respect people and appreciate and value them. Mm -hmm. And I've always kind of enjoyed being with people and learning more about them. So that's an, I think that's an attribute that does help you in politics. Mm -hmm. but I don't know that it is the thing, yeah. at least for me, that says you will run. So for what is the issues? Yeah, yeah, right. So let's talk about the issues. So what would you say were some of the more defining issues of your political career? Would you say women's issues were some of the most important issues that you brought to the table in your candidacy and while you were governing, or were there uh, an assortment of issues? There were an assortment of issues. Uh, I can remember knocking on doors, because then when you find out you're a Republican, you're in a minority, man, you've got to get people to cross over. You know, I thought, oh, wow. 
I can remember knocking on the door and people saying, are you running as a woman? I thought, I don't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that's going to be the case. But no, uh, in fact, in Congress, I, I was on, um, I chaired the technology uh, subcommittee for a while. I did a lot of work with NIST, uh, with uh, NIH, with FDA. For our listener. Federal. For our listeners, NIST would be the National Institute on Standards of Technology, NIH would be the National Institutes of Health, and FDA would be the Food and Drug Administration. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, we, we sometimes get swept up in our autonomous society, <laughs> and we forget that <laughs> using these letter codes don't mean anything to most people. But yes, that's the vitality of the region that I represented, mm-hmm. and federal employees, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I chaired the District of Columbia for a while, too. Interesting. The yeah. Why were you, you've been placed by leadership, by, by other elected officials, whether it's George W. Bush putting you on the OECD um, uh, ambassador to that organization, whether it's, you know, the speaker putting you on a technology subcommittee. You've had quite a variety of assignments. How do you explain that? What were the rationales for being appointed to all these various bodies? Well, I think, it, I think in Congress... Really, these were the issues that affected my district. Mm -hmm. You mentioned women's issues. Of course, I was always involved with women's issues, the Violence Against Women Act, and Mm -hmm. the Office of Research at Women's Health at NIH. Yeah. uh, Right. Uh, And and even women in construction, uh, women in science, engineering, and technology. Yeah. But in addition to that, you know, there's a plethora of other issues that affect the people that I'm honored to represent. Right. And so it was like, yeah, federal employees, maybe somebody from Arizona would not really want that committee, but I wanted it. Maybe somebody from Arizona would not care about, or from Wyoming would not care about the National Institute of Standards and Technology, even though it is a, a gem yeah. for the National Institutes of Health. Yeah. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Because so that's that. lo- those were located in your district, and a preponderance of your constituents are employed by the federal government. Oh, yes. So I, so I knew a lot about it. Uh-huh. I made it a point to know a lot about them and what they did in terms of... of um, Enhancing our country. So, I mean, it was country first. Yeah. And then constituents and conscience. Interesting. So, was it the same order of priorities when you were in the Maryland General Assembly? Because oftentimes they say district, county, state. But you just said nation, district, conscience. Please. Except that in the state legislature, you are confined to your state. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I did not legislate for Arizona or Wyoming. But I you're not. I legislated for Maryland. But you were represented from a portion of Montgomery County, yet you did have the ability to enact laws affecting areas as diverse as Washington County and Western Maryland oh, and yeah. Talbot County and Southern so Maryland. State. Right. right. So, so, you know, as an analogy, when you were in the Maryland General Assembly, was your first loyalty to your legislative district, to your county, or to your state? My state. Really? State and county. I think sometimes I put the county be well. No, see, my county was so vibrant. Montgomery yeah. County stands out. I mean, the most money <laughs> given to various agencies and whatever. So I thought I felt that what was good for my county was probably going to be good for my state. That's and if so. not, to begin to look at it a little bit more. I served on the appropriations committee when I was in um, the state legislature. Yeah, and. Um, uh, yeah, we got a lot of things. We actually got a lot of things done, even in terms of victims' rights. Also, in terms of, I was on the committee on law enforcement and transportation. Um, even got the um, those uh, spots for getting your driver's license, mm-hmm. the local ones, where you can get them established, the mobile oh. units, and oh, oh, just a lot of things that help my county, but help my state also. Did you ever find yourself in a position where you were saying, well, on the one hand, this is in the best interest of the state, but it's someone at the expense of of local people, of of my constituency who actually elected me into office? I know that that's happened in recent times. Did you ever encounter that? It's hard. It's hard. It's a very tough decision when you have to make it. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think you do whatever you think is is the highlight. For the instance, thing to do. like a very clear example would be funding the Maryland Stadium Authority to build Camden Yards for the Baltimore Orioles or later for, for the Baltimore Ravens, their stadium, right? So that brings in revenue and tourism for Baltimore City, which helps the state. And there's a lot of, or, right, or the sure. convention center under Donald Schaefer, 
Um, but on the other hand, you know, those are statewide tax dollars and people in southern, western, eastern Maryland and your own constituency in Montgomery County, you know, maybe they go up to a game here or there, but the real economic benefit is by the bars and restaurants and hotels in Baltimore City. So you know, you're spending taxpayer dollars. H- how did you justify that to constituents? Well, it, it's hard to it's hard to generalize. It would depend upon each issue naturally. And sure. You weigh, it, you weigh it very heavily. You get all the information, but uh, but you know, as from some of the examples you give, mm-hmm. I would think the vitality of the state is going to benefit all the counties. So I want to now bring the conversation a little bit back to some of the the, the main themes from the beginning of this conversation, which is there's there used to be a glass ceiling where there weren't women in certain areas of the economy and there weren't women in certain elected offices and you uh correct me if i'm wrong came through uh the political life came into the u.s congress when there weren't too many women as your colleagues can and and you were really and, and one of your many issues was that you were interested in was advancing the cause of women in this country can you speak about if there ever was such a thing as a men's club um, among legislators, can you speak about what it was like to be female in the U.S. Congress and, and, and remind us of what year you entered the Congress and then how you interact with other female legislators at that time? I entered Congress in 1986 and served uh, through 2003, and there were 24 women and it was almost 50-50 Republican-Democrat. Few of them were represented um, other other regions. Um, and there were two in the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a pretty small number when you think of uh, 24 out of 435 and 2 out of 102. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things I always valued was getting together with other women. Um, by that I mean we had a congressional caucus on women's issues. Mm-hmm. And we even ended up getting a room, which they still have, which was which is called the uh, uh, the Congresswoman's Reading Room. Incidentally, we named it the Lindy Boggs back in um, I think it was 1998 or whatever. Right, I'll tell you that story too. So we would meet periodically and talk about issues in common and where we might be able to muster up support. Very often, the guys would say, the members of Congress, when they would see like four or five women kind of coming out of that room or on the floor of the house together talking, oh my God, what are they going to have now Mm -hmm. for us to look at? And so obviously 24 are not going to be able to pass any bill. Uh So you had to to do what any legislator does. You had to demonstrate to your male colleagues why this was going to help them and help their constituency and maybe bring in some um, uh, other groups you know, to lobby them also so they could see that this is important. And incidentally, maybe half of your con- of their constituencies might have been female at any given well, time. Well, I mean, <laughs> look, look at the Violence Against Women Act. It took quite a while for that to happen. We had a lot of separate pieces of legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but then eventually, uh, getting the groups, right, the groups within their district, the women's clubs, and reminding them of their of their families, their, their uh, wives, their children, their daughters, their, you know, their husbands, their friends, and then getting organizations to help too. Like we got uh, some of the insurance companies, we got some of the health agencies mm-hmm. uh, also to come in. So business, business um, uh, has a very important task, I think, in big pieces of legislation passing mm-hmm. to demonstrate they are. They care about it. That they're interested. They have employees, mm-hmm. and their employees are the ones who have the families. Yeah, and that's what society is all about. So yes, I think working together was very helpful. And then I, I think, uh, I think in general, uh, sometimes women have a little, little difficulty being taken seriously to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're like only one of two women on the committee, mm-hmm. um, I mean, you can be respected. But maybe they don't see you as a strong voice. But that has changed. That has changed. Mm -hmm. I think women have had to work harder Mm -hmm. and have done that. Mm -hmm. And their voices are just as strong as that of the men. Have the men had a men's club? Of course. The gym even used to be just men. You know, now it's both. And and sure, you know, it's... it's, uh, it's something that happens. You have a, a fraternity or a sorority of people who have some similarity, and there were so many of them, of course. Right. 
Did you do you ever see a day when men might join the women's uh, caucus? For instance, there are many male members, myself included, of of certain uh, women's mm-hmm. political clubs in Montgomery oh, yeah. County. Oh yeah. Well, they wanted to. They wanted to join the women's caucus, and we had a big meeting about should we allow them to, and yeah, maybe we could, they can be considered auxiliary, auxiliary, but not actually to be part of the club because we felt that um, that that was going to take away from, I don't know, some of the strength of it or some of the, not confidentiality, but yeah. personal, the yeah. personal comfort element of it. Yeah. So, um, but some of my, my best compatriots and colleagues who pushed legislation were men. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. Well, we're, we're nearing the end of the podcast, unfortunately, and as much as we can stay here forever, um, I'd like to ask you to reflect on your life in public service, volunteering, being in elected office, the many issues you've pushed Mm -hmm. forward. And I want you to think of two questions, respond to two ideas. One, what is your legacy? Why is the world a better place? Because Connie Morella has been in it. (laughs) And, and two, I guess, um, I want you to think a little bit about, uh, I guess you you know anything how your motivations may have evolved over time whereas you know what you were first thinking when you were running for student government in high school and college to seeing the women's movement to if your motivations have remained constant over time in public service or if somehow um your understanding of public service has evolved over time I feel um good that I'm a happy camper and I'm a very lucky person Um, I've had a number of barriers and obstacles, I suppose, along the way. I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. Uh, I remember my mother had the benefit of coming to my first swearing-in. And quite as an aside, uh, Senator Sarbanes came there, Democrat, was there. And my mother didn't know the difference between the political parties there. Uh And she said, oh, thank you so much for helping my daughter. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The senator smiled and said, oh, you're welcome. (laughs) For our listeners, Senator Paul Sarbanes was a Democratic U.S. senator. Obviously, Connie Morella ran as a Republican. Therefore, Sarbanes would not have helped Connie Morella in her run for office. I I just hope that in terms of a legacy, that there are people who who say, gee, you know... um, I'm a little better off because she passed this legislation, or she helped me with my visa, or she helped my child get into a school, or this piece of legislation has made a difference in my life. I just hope that having had the opportunity to serve, that that is part of some kind of a legacy. I hope also at the same time that I have been that I've been a good mother mm-hmm. and a good parent. You, you know, we've raised a, an extended family of my late sister's six children plus our three children. Oh, my goodness. And I have many precinct in my own house. And so I just hope that I, hope that I have uh, lived up to the possibilities that were given to me. And I had a lot, of, a lot of opportunities and a lot of privileges that many people perhaps don't have. But I just think it's a great country. I, I hope to continue to try to touch people in, uh, with appropriate um, concepts, attitudes, benefits. Um, and uh, again, I'm lucky. The harder you work, the luckier you get, I, you, you get, I guess. Although I just have been very fortunate. Well... Thank you. That has been uh, former Congresswoman Connie Morella, who speaks about her lifetime in service as having had many opportunities to influence many individuals and that her legacy is the ability to have even a slight impact on one individual's life in many different circumstances and that in many lives, she hopes over the course of her life, she has made just even a little bit of difference for the better. Um, and, and, and that little drop in the bucket uh, may have very many lasting positive ramifications. Um, and, and for that, for her, uh, that is meaningful. Um, and uh, 
So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Congresswoman. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, this has been episode 61 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.